You're listening to sermons from La Cañada Congregational Church and Pastor Kyle Sears. Join us in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. in La Cañada for worship. You can find more information about our church online at lacanadachurch.org. Would you consider yourself a morning person? Would you raise your hand? I mean, you're here, so kind of, <laughs> you know, right? Um, I consider myself a morning person, not really because of what time I get up, because there's always that other person who's like, well, I get up at 4.30 or whatever. Um, it's more of, of how I get up, and that's kind of my qualifications for a morning person. There are some people who love to hit that snooze button over and over again, or just lay in bed with this slow realization that the day is starting, and so they drag from, from the bed and kind of go into zombie mode through their routine or, or maybe even holding that subtle anger that life has continued to go on. Um, but, but I don't really hesitate to, you know, get up when the alarm goes off, brush my teeth, hit the shower, grab some coffee, take the dog out for a walk. I, I've always, uh, even as a kid, started my day when the day's ready to go. Um, and normally when I'm doing that, uh, I've got some song bopping through my head that I'm humming or singing. Uh, something that's been stuck there for days. Um, and, and our text today suggests that maybe we should live our life as if we were a morning person, hopeful for what might come next, deliberate as we get ready for it, and maybe even with a song in our heart as we go. And so this is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 20. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, sleeper awake, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so far in this latter half of Ephesians, we have been encouraged to walk according to our calling and faith and to walk in love and now to walk in light. And this is contrasted to this idea of walking in darkness. If you've ever had to wake up in the middle of the night to you know, keep your dogs from barking like my new one has been doing, you might be timid about what's lurking in the shadows. A stubbed toe is likely to happen. You're hesitant, even in the most familiar of circumstances. And yet in the light, we clearly know what our next step is, even if the path is unexplored. Now, I don't want to take this dualistic way of thinking so simply that we don't understand that, that our life is not going to suddenly become easier because we're following Christ. But the idea is that it will be fruitful. It will be meaningful. Now that we can see where we're going and where we are headed forward, we can be more present to attend to the ways that God is doing work within us. And within that light, what we discover is all that is good and true and right. And once more, this is an invitation for us to see how life is given in the context of relationships. That goodness and rightness and truth do not exist in a vacuum. They're not some pristine ideal that we appreciate from behind a velvet rope. Instead, these are things that take up the space between us, or at least they should. That goodness is aimed toward the needs of others, of seeing that those who are in need of a sense of justice or just the bonus of something happening in their life can be given by those of us who now walk in the light. That rightness is how we sense our space among others, this total alignment of our being, not just that we are right in health, but in heart and mind and soul and community. You can never, you ever feel off with people sometimes, right? There was just something off about that interaction. The rightness that we find here is when our relationships are connected in the way that they are meant to be. And truth is being our authentic selves 
that rejects this deception of having to put on a certain persona in order to be welcomed. And within all of this calling to, to cultivate this goodness and righteousness and truth, we're told that wisdom is, is underneath all of this, is figuring out what God wants. We get a sense of what is good and right and true, but sometimes laying our hands on that requires some trial and error. We've got to play around a little bit with the ingredients to see what it means for today, now, in this moment. And so when this writer says that we are to figure it out, on one hand, this is an invitation to see, does this way of living, of following Christ and walking in light, actually work? Does it actually do what it says it's going to do? As we figure it out, we are figuring out, is God faithful to God's promises? Again, not that life will be easy, but that it will be good and right and true. But figuring it out also includes testing the limits of it, of, of learning what pleases God. And that means we're always open to asking questions always open to a faith that refuses to settle for cliches that have been frozen in time, always willing to use scripture as a springboard into tomorrow to say that we will be asking questions that the Bible may have never asked before, but we can use the insight and wisdom that it has to answer questions that we may not even anticipate. This way of being, of living within God's intentions for our time and place will uncover the rottenness of the mundane evil that thrives in the dark. Here we have two commands in this passage. Expose the darkness, but don't mention what's being done. That shameful stuff that people do while everyone else is asleep. That feels contradictory, right? How am I gonna expose it if I don't talk about it? <laughs> or if you don't talk about it, when you're not exposing it. But I take it to mean that we shouldn't ignore the corruption around us but we shouldn't hyper-focus on it either, right? I'm, I'm really bad at doom scrolling through the internet and reading all of the news about how everything is terrible and nothing is getting better. And that rots me more than it does strengthens me. But one way we, we expose the reality of the corruption around us is simply by walking in the light showing evil for what it is, as deceptive and false and empty of whatever promises it makes. And so when we live into goodness and truth and rightness, we don't have to do a whole lot of other work saying, look at how bad everything else is. You know, there, there are times when I say something in a sermon uh, or sometimes something in the community, and I sense that it may not be fully embraced by everyone. We remember the hot dog ketchup episode, but, um, but you know, when we raised our pride flag last year, someone drove by angrily honking at us as we were raising it. Um, I was not surprised. I still get anonymous emails asking me to read my Bible more, and I would maybe change my mind. Um, I've made controversial statements in public like gun violence is bad uh, that really gets under the skin of some folks. And, and none of that surprises me. I, I, I feel like I know how to respond to that. But I'm, I'm often left dumbfounded when someone suggests that us providing lunches to homeless and hungry people is a net bad thing because we're just, you know, enabling them to be reliant instead of teaching them to bootstrap their way out of hunger. Um, I was like, well, you know, feed the hungry seems to feel to me like a no-brainer. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to, to, to do that here. And, and you know, the, the response here of by us just doing our thing, we, we reveal the convictions underneath that often point to the way that we have just swallowed so many lies about what it means to be good and right and true that we lose ourselves in that where we can't even say, hey, it's a good thing. A sandwich is a good thing for a hungry, hungry person. There's this bit of a, a kind of a, a, a rattling in the middle of this, um, where it seems that the writer is quoting a hymn that would have been familiar in this early church, saying, wake up. <laughs> You've hit the snooze alarm too much. Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead. And one of the reasons we walk in the light is because it is 
not just the light of the day, but it's the light of Easter, of the day of resurrection. And I really believe that what we think about life and death and resurrection matters because it sets the tone for how we will live. And if we wanna just kind of pull the sheets over our head and hide from the rest of the day, or if we're willing to get up with a song in our heart. You see, we're told that Jesus' resurrection happens on the first day of the week with the idea that this is the eighth day of creation, a new creation that is starting, a new week that is beginning, and not just a new week that is beginning, but a new time is beginning, a new reality is breaking in with the resurrection. And it's not just a resurrection that's now locked just for Jesus to enjoy, but it's a resurrection that is promised for all of us to enjoy, a new day that all of us are waking up to. And that when we realize that this new day undoes so much of what has fallen apart with the original week of creation, we sense an invitation to live within a new reality. And that while it may be true that none of us has yet to experience this resurrection, what we claim is that because Jesus found God faithful to him, that we too will find God faithful to us. That the threat of a resurrection that leads to nothing but judgment and rejection has been done away with. Because in Jesus we find all that is good and right and true. And so while this thing lies in its future, and our future, it is powerful enough to cast its light back through time to today. As if it's an alarm clock shaking us awake, saying the sun is up, it's time to go. Arise, you who sleep, and rise from the dead. We are called forward to anticipate the coming day as if it were happening right now. And so our life is lived within this kind of in-between moment, between our sleep and our awaking where the alarm is going off and incorporating itself into our dreams somehow. That moment as we put our feet on the floor and get moving, that, that moment when all of the day is filled with potential, that nothing has yet happened to spoil what may be. Those first moments when we arise are the moments that can be brimming with hope. Imagine if our life had that sense that tomorrow is coming and today matters because of it. You see, if we sing, arise you who sleep and rise from the dead, within that is this sense of sleep and death. We are not un, un, unwriting that reality, ignoring the pain and sorrow that is often felt by us and that those around us that we love. You see, the power of the resurrection is that it is paired with the power of the cross. And you can't separate those two. It is one event happening together this moment of time where we acknowledge the sorrow of the world, the darkness of the world, the corruptibility of the world that's not just out there, but often within us too, and yet knowing that God does not give up on it. That God's not willing to leave it there to rot, but instead is willing to call it back to life. That in the same way that our death becomes God's death, so too God's resurrection becomes our resurrection. And so much of this talk among Christians about resurrection in the future often will only create Christians who don't care about today, who just wanna to wait to die when all of their bliss will finally be realized. When I was a kid, they would say, they're so heavenly minded, they do no earthly good. We're just kind of waiting around for everything to fall apart. But you see here in, in this text, we are called to make the most of our time because the days are evil, corrupted, fleeting. And so instead of just letting them pass by, we make the most of the relationships and connections and meanings that we find wherever we find ourselves. 
We don't just throw up our hands and wait until heaven. We seek to discover and reveal the light of heaven today because the truth is, is that light has cast itself back to us right now. And that's what we're celebrating. And we're encouraged to sing together. Not those drunken songs, you know, where everyone's just sort of mumbling at the bar and, you know, kind of getting through whatever lyrics they can remember, but something that connects us with other people. Um, Occasionally we'll be on a road trip with the family and something will come on Spotify that everyone knows and doesn't mind singing. It's typically Taylor Swift. Um, But you know, that's that four quadrant appeal with her of, of all of us in the car ready, ready to sing. And sometimes, you know, harmony will break out from the back seat somehow. Uh, and we are just singing. And maybe you've experienced something like this with your family, or maybe you've been in a, a stadium. I took uh, the, whole, the whole family to Foo Fighters concert at SoFi. And when the whole stadium is singing ever long and you can't hear yourself sing, even though you're screaming at the top of your lungs, there's something powerful with that kind of moment of feeling like I am connected to all of you humanity by singing this song. That music connects us to a feeling of something greater, and that's the energy behind this text, of singing songs and hymns and spiritual psalms, knowing that in gratitude that all of creation has been resurrected to join in this music with us. And so imagine if we start our day with not getting drunk to dampen our senses and dull ourselves to the ache of the world around us, but instead connecting to the light of heaven. And as we look around, we see everything coming to life. It's an invitation to find a reason to sing. And I know some of you say, I can't sing. (laughs) But you sing in your car, right? Even if you can't really sing, you sing in your car, you sing in the shower, you sing as you're, you know, doing chores or something. It doesn't have to be some majestic piece of music, but it's even the simplest of songs, of humming whatever little ditties in your head as a way of revealing what lies within our heart. That the death and decay of this world is not so powerful that it can claim all of who we are. But instead that the light of God is shining upon us and inviting us to wake up and sing. Amen.